want a new partner. They want a new partner. And so, uh, but yeah, we won't, we won't go there. Um, I'm, I'm, some of you are like, were you the one? <laughs> so yeah, I, um, I'm really excited for this session because, lighten this up, uh, because a lot of the things that we are going to discuss, and I say we, it's going to be, I want to step back. True learning and true growth is social. It's a group effort. You don't need some pundit up here telling you how to think and what, and we, what to do and how to be a leader and how to create a high-performing environment. You're the practitioners. You're the ones, boots on the ground. You've been doing this for years. And my hope, my goal in the next 45 minutes to 60 minutes, hour or so, is to have you share with each other best practices as I share these different principles that we're going to be discussing. At lunch, we were talking about uh, one of the things that I, I get, I, I love this topic so much, it can come off as like motivational speaker-ish. And that's one of my big things. I always say, no, I'm not a motivational speaker. Uh, that's not what I, this, there's science behind it. There's data behind it. So you want to make sure that what work, help people understand what works for this person might not work for this person. What works for this person in this situation does not work for that same person in another situation. And so I am very aware of all of that. We are going to go through some research that shows how to create a high-performance environment. Now, I invite you to take some of these things and throw it in the trash. You, ha you can completely disagree with me because it might not work in your environment. You might be like, no, this does not work for me. And I'll raise my hand, this is why it doesn't work, or this is, um, this is how I need to adapt it for my environment. Going along with that, you might hear some of these things, and you might tweak it. You might be like, oh, okay, I, I like that part, but I don't like this part, and I'm going to go apply it. Uh, and there might be some things that are completely novel ideas to you. You're like, I never thought about it that way. Let me give it a try. As you go through this today, my hope also is that, yes, we're talking about work, and being a leader, but just by a show of hands, anybody have any children, any kid, kids, okay, have kids? Hopefully, hopefully, you might be able to think about, hey, maybe I could apply this to my, my youngster, whether they play a sport or not. You're going to learn something today that, from what I've heard, the feedback I get, they're like, I'm not even going to apply this to me as a, as a boss, but I'm going to apply this at my home. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this with my significant other. And, uh, and so I can't wait to hear everything that you have to say. But we are going to kick things off with a simple little, again, a little, we're going to prime our minds again. But this one's not going to be a game. It's not going to be an activity. It's going to be very simple. With somebody sitting next to you, and if you have to go to a table and find, all I want you to share with them is what is something that's been insightful to you or something you've liked so far in this conference? What has been something you've learned, you've enjoyed, you've liked so far in this conference today? Something simple, something easy. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes. Time is yours. Ready, set, go. Okay, sorry to interrupt you. We're, so we're going to do a lot of, there's going to be a lot of participation in this session. Uh, once again, because I respect your expertise and I respect your experience. So we want to hear, you never realize that sometimes what you share might be the takeaway for somebody else, not something that I even share. Uh, somebody from this side, is there anything in particular that, that was uh, insightful for you that you'd be willing to share that you just shared with the partner? We'll just go one, one from this side. Without a microphone, without a microphone. Your chat will work. Please. Okay, 
That was your that was that was your takeaway. Okay, very good. That was something intriguing, something insightful, something wonderful. Thank you. Just go one from this side, please. Yes. Yeah. Anyone? I see, I'm seeing head nods. Anybody else agree with that? Anybody else get a sense of that? Okay, good, good. I, I felt that. I felt the same thing. Um, thank you for sharing that. Okay, so part two with your partner. Okay, so part two. Let me let me give you a look a look behind the scenes a little bit. Why we just did that activity. Elite performers are incredibly hard on themselves. Incredibly hard on themselves, and I do not think they have the corner market on on that on being hard on yourself. I think there are men and women in this room who are more hard on themselves than anybody else could be. You beat up on yourself for those tiny little things that nobody else even notices, doesn't even notice. So one thing that we do after a performance, we do a lot of AAR, AARs, after action reviews. So they'll come and we'll sit, and I'll look at them, and the first question I ask is, what did you do well? What went well? And for some of them, it is so difficult to conjure up something that they did well because they can't even fathom. Even if they, they played well, the results are well, they're, they're always nitpicking themselves. I could have done this, could have done this. It's a great exercise to do because it helps you realize that, hey, I'm doing some things well. We have something called a negativity bias. It's easier to be negative than be positive, just naturally. This is how we are wired. That's just how, how things are. However, if you're not careful, that can deteriorate decision making. And so it's very important to filter in, flex your optimistic muscle. These are some of the things we're doing well. Just to not sugarcoat everything and be an ostrich, put your head in the sand, but to say, no, there are some things we're doing well. The second question that we ask these guys is, what did you learn today? What, you just answered that question. What did I learn so far? When you ask yourself that question consistently, okay, what did I learn today? What did I learn today? Your brain is now going to be primed to be, help you become a learning machine. And you're going to be able to learn just at astronomical rates, not just from yourself, but you can learn from someone else. You can learn from their successes, their mistakes, and then you just become this learning machine. And then the last question we ask is, what are you going to do better tomorrow? What are you going to do better tomorrow to give them, put them in the driver's seat to help them realize, okay, this is what I need to do tomorrow, my behaviors, my, the thing I'm going to work on, I'm going to focus on, that target. You just did one of the questions. What did I learn so far today? And as you continue to ask yourself that question, that's so powerful. Okay, back into the session. Next question with your partner. I want you to share with them what makes your job not generally speaking, I'm not talking about your general job, but you specifically, your unique job, difficult. What makes, and don't point at somebody, okay, don't say that person, no, I'm not looking for that. I'm just saying, just you're the ops, generally speaking, generally speaking, what, and this isn't, a, this isn't, a, let's just keep, a, this isn't a complaining fest, let's just say that. I'm not trying to bring that mood down, you're going to see where we're going to go with this. What makes your job difficult? And you're not complaining. You're just stating the facts. What makes it hard? A couple minutes. Time is yours. Time is yours.
About 30 seconds, 30 seconds. All right, thanks once again. Thank you very much for, uh, for participating. We're gonna go with this table right here. We'll go with this, anyone, actually, let's do this. This table, this table only. When I say go, everyone at this table point to somebody else at the table. Whoever has the most fingers pointing at them, they're the, they're the person. When I say go, ready, set, go. Okay, we have, we have, you got one, we got two. Okay, it looks like you got the most. What's your name? <laughs> Harry, Harry, what did, what did, what were some of the things you discussed? Some difficult, uh, some things that makes your job difficult. So when you talk about the, uh, the labor market, I was saying how it used to be much more broad out of certainty and basically working with customers, printers, in some cases publishers, and basically, uh, you know, not knowing exactly what you need when you need it, and then when you're able to execute, it's not always there from a mill, mill perspective. Did anybody else say anything that sounded similar to what Harry just said in your tables? Any, any, anything similar? Just by a show of hands, just, just generally speaking? Okay, somewhat. Anyone else want to add anything that made yours difficult? That any, anyone from this table? We don't have to do the finger game here. Anyone from here? What, what's something that, that makes your job hard? People's time. People's time. I don't know if you heard that, but time, time FaceTime with people, it just makes it very difficult. Uh, just getting, getting, being able to get in front of somebody. Anybody else agree? Agree? You've seen that? Yeah. Oh, a lot of hands on that. One. Any others, to, just generally speaking, that you can think of? Any others? Yes, please. So, just because of the times we're in, high demand, you find yourself becoming so much more tactical in how you approach solving a customer's problem that at the end of the day. so much of your time you're servicing that customer. Now, we know that that's going to pay dividends in the future because you're becoming a, a great resource for them. But at the same time, you know, you have to kind of step back and not just plan for that. You have to plan for the future. That takes a lot. As, you, as you're talking, I'm seeing a lot of head nods. Like, there's a lot of people behind you are like, yes, amen to that. That is uh, what I, the reason I like to do this activity and the reason I did this activity here is to normalize the difficulty of your job. I didn't hear any complaining going on, and sometimes, yeah, we're human, we're gonna complain about situations, but what you acknowledge is the difficulty of your situation. There's an acronym that we always talk about in, in, in sports and in military, VUCA. Situation is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And for what I'm hearing, it sounds like it's very similar to yours. It's volatile, you're gonna have a lot of this, Uncertain, there's a lot of uncertainty, which also leads to things you have no control over that you wish you could, but you gotta figure it out. A lot of uncertainty, a lot of, you have to make big decisions with very little data sometimes, and you wonder, okay, how are we gonna do this? Uh, complex, complicated. It's, it's not as simple as someone from the outside say, why don't you just do X? It's like, well, if we do X, it's gonna affect this, 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 and this. So we don't understand the systems theory behind it, and finally, ambiguous. It's just there's not a lot of specificity with some of the decisions you're making. And a lot of the things that you're de dealing with are people, personalities, people you're leading or people you work with. It makes it very difficult. So what I would like you to do is to yourself, as you're thinking about your own personal obstacles, my invitation is I'm going to ask you this question in about 45 minutes. I'm going to ask you that we're going to come back to this question. What is something that we are gonna talk about now that can help you navigate the adversity you're currently facing? So thinking about what you're going through right now, 
I'm gonna come back. What are certain things we're about to talk about? Which one of these tools can help you navigate what you're going through? Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through and give you some principles to cultivating a high performance environment or being a high performance leader, starting with principle number one. Principle number one. This is one of my favorite principles to talk about because it's so important. Build relationships so strong they could bear the weight of truth. Build relationships so strong that it can bear the weight of truth. Just if you pause and just think about that, think about the relationships, the strongest relationships you have. You probably have some relationship with people. They can say things to you that you won't allow anybody else to tell you, but because you love this person and you have so much trust with this individual, you will allow them to give you the kind of feedback, in-your-face feedback, don't just straight to the point, hit you right between the eyes, that you will not allow anybody else to give you because of your trust. And you can do the same for them. By a show of hands, does anybody have somebody like that? Like some, and sometimes they offer it unsolicited, and it just is really bothersome. But, but hey, as you have those, as I was saying, I'm seeing smiles on faces, and you're thinking about that person. So the question becomes, how do you do that? How do you increase that level with somebody? How do you, how do, you do that? So there is a marriage and family therapist, uh, John Gottman, who ran some really interesting studies, and he ended up noticing that if you give him a little interaction between any two individuals, primarily in this study was husband and wife, but if he goes, if you give him a little sample size of it, he can give you, he can tell you how strong that relationship is, generally speaking. And again, I, I roll that. How do you really know? There's so many things. But there sh he showed statistical data to show that, okay, one of the things that you can tell strength of relationship is how somebody responds to the good news of somebody else. How do you respond? How does this partner respond to the good news of this partner, not bad news, good news. And according to him, there are four ways and four ways only you could respond, one of which is the effective way. Only one way to respond that's actually going to build your relationship with somebody. And so if you're a leader of a group, if you're a leader, CEO, you're leading people, or even with your family, if you want to build a relationship, this is how to do it. So I'm going to give you four ways, three ways not to do it first. There are four ways to respond. Way number one, can somebody please give me, um, can somebody just give me some good news, any good news that's happened in the last 24 hours to you and your personal, in your personal life, your personal family? Can somebody just, you can just shout out just random good news. All right, um, so we're going to go on to the second. <laughs> did you see what I did? Okay, way number one on how not to respond is to ignore them. That is the worst. That is, that's not, there's actually something worse than that. But that, you just saw it. You just, I literally just showed it. How many times has someone shared something great news like that? That's amazing. That's amazing news. Um, it's so awkward doing it, too. I feel so like, it's just like, oh, it's just like, I can't ha hold character, hold character. Um, it completely ignored it. How many times as a leader or as a parent or as a friend, as a significant other, did they share good news? Hey, how you doing? Oh, this happened. Okay, well, I need, I need this or I need that. Just completely just brush it off. That is one way to not build a relationship so strong you can bear the weight of truth. Number one way, no, it's called ignoring the ignorer ignorer number two way of how not to do it can somebody please give me some good news i'm going to show you another way on how not to do it how not to build a relationship can somebody please share me good news you won the powerball tomorrow you like real good news like like <laughs> like, like real like real like uh yeah so you could even say Actually, yeah, real, real good news. That was, a, that was a good one. That was a good one. You got me. You stumped me. Can someone give me uh, something that actually happened? Good news. 
But the Buccaneers, did you see the Buccaneer game? So Tom Brady, he came back and he ended up coming and beating the Los Angeles, here in town, the Los Angeles Rams. Do you see what I did? This is called the one-upper. This is when someone shares something really cool, great news, and you come right in and you swoop in with something even better, something even, even higher, something more special. Just, and it, sometimes you don't, we don't even realize we do it. And you get on the phone or someone shares something great and you're like, oh, well, listen to what this person did or listen to what I did. This is a one-upper, once again, does not build relationships. Number three, here's a third way on how not to build a relationship. Can I get someone to please share some good news on how not, I'm gonna give you an example, how not to build a relationship. Now you're kind of nervous, like, oh, can I get, yeah, any, any good news? I'm gonna show you the third way. He said he was promoted three weeks ago. It's a lot of work. Um, it's like you get promotions, and then probably you get away from family more, you gotta leave more people, you got more problems. Now you have just more logistics, you have just more just uh, administrative stuff. Oh, sorry, man. <laughs> this is called the joy thief. Congrats, that's awesome. This is called the joy thief. So the joy thief is really interesting because it takes someone's good news and you just dump on it. You just kind of like, you take their good news and you make, you turn it into bad. And this is probably one of the worst of all because you literally, that's why it's called the joy thief. You rip the joy out of their good news. They're taking time to share with you their good news and you're bringing it down. These are the, it's when your kid comes up to you and says, oh, I want to, I want to be a doctor when I grow up. Instead of being, whatever, we're going to do the last one and say, oh, really? You want to do that? You want to go to that school? You want to, do you know how much money that's going to cost? Those little tiny things that we can pull down, usually you see a lot with parents and kids. Kids will share something and then parents will pull it down. Just a simple joy thief. Well, why would you do that? That's terrible. That's horrible. It's like, oh, okay. Okay, here's the last one. This is the one, according to John Gottman, the one singular way on how to build a relationship so strong it could bear the weight of truth. It's my favorite one. Can someone please share me some good news? Okay. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I do have a, I have a question about what has been something in particular that you personally have liked about it, about these sessions for, for you personally? Yeah, do you think, and so obviously I know who you're referring to, um, uh, so, but, but do you feel, because I will tell you this, coming in, new audience, new place, I don't, I'm like, okay, are they going to like this? Is this going to even resonate at all? How does what you, the priming thing in the morning, how did that session, how do you think that relates to what you do in your job? Um, it's exactly the opposite of what I do. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I love it. <laughs> so here's what happened. So whether it be this conversation, this is called ACR, Active Constructive Responding. Did you notice what I did with this when he shared the good news? Exa I kept asking questions to make him, to help him relive. Give me more details. Give me more details. Tell me more about that. Active constructive responding is basically showing them if it matters to you, if it matters to you, let's relive this for a little bit. If somebody comes up to you, and let me just use a benign example, they had a good, they ate at a good restaurant, ate at a good restaurant, oh, I had a, hey, what's the latest? Oh, I had a, oh, I had a great dinner last night. Here's active constructive responding, ACR. It's called the joy multiplier. Right, that's the label of this one, joy multiplier. Really, where did you eat? Oh, I went here. Awesome. Who did you go with? Oh, I went to these people. What did you have? Oh, was it good? Oh, that's awesome. So you would recommend me going. And so as you can see, all I'm doing is getting them to relive that experience again. And then off we go. And it can happen really quick. You could be in an elevator, and they could be like, Ma, I just saw this movie last night. It was awesome. Instead of ignoring them, instead of one-upping them, instead of joy-thiefing it, you could be like, oh, what did you like about it? 
blah, 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 sweet, have a good day. Boom, and you leave. You just ACR'd them. You just did active, constructive responding. Now, what I will say, couple of, couple of things, couple of things. You do not ACR some, but you don't joy multiply something that is dangerous. So if somebody's like, if kids, if your child's like, oh my gosh, I just met, I just met this person yesterday and we're getting married next week. You're not going to be like, oh, that's, where did you meet them? Oh, that's great. No, like, no, you don't, you don't, if it's dangerous or if it's something that's ridiculous, you're not going to ACR it. That's one, that's, that's one thing. Another thing is, let's say your child comes home and I'm just, I'm using children examples because I don't know your business. Uh, so I'm just keeping it something universal. So let's say a child comes home and child's like, hey, mom, dad, I got a, I got a C on my test. I got a C. And they're just thrilled. And you're like, oh, C. Like, we're not a C family. Like, what are we, what are we doing here? So what do you do? What, how do you ACR something that you're like, oh, I don't want to celebrate. That's, that's not good news. C, a C is not good. Or a B or an A, like whatever your standards of excellence are. Uh, fill in the blank. And so you're like, oh, uh, I don't want to do this. So this is what you do. You have two conversations. Why are you so happy about that? Oh, it was such a hard test, this and that. Oh, okay. What did you do to prepare for it? Oh, I, I studied this and that. Okay, awesome. Okay, great. You're not going to go overboard, but you'll ACR it. They're like, okay, great. Break the conversation. So they leave knowing I was listened to. Okay, I shared it. They asked me some questions. Oh, great. Conversation broke. Whatever amount of time you need, five minutes, 10 minutes, next day, more than 15 seconds, but break it, go back to that person, go back to that child in this instance and say, hey, I was thinking about our conversation. You just signaled that you were thinking about me. And I was thinking about that you got to see, okay, so tell me about this. What could we do to get that up? What could you do more of to get it to a B or maybe get it to an A? So what you're signaling to them is, number one, not only, we already had an ACR. Okay, we already, it was a good news. Now I'm coming back to give you feedback. Now let's get better. Now let's take it to the next level. So you didn't dump on their good news. That's why you want to create some space to show them that, hey, I was, I was thinking about you. And so you want to have that second conversation. So principle number one, build relationships so strong they could bear the weight of truth. How do you do that? Joy multiply their good news. So the next time you hear someone's good news as a leader or whatever, and you'll listen for it, just listen for it, before you jump in and one-up it, turn it down, ignore it, or whatever, even one, practice with one question, one ACR joy multiplying question. So I taught this session, this tool, to a group of commanding officers with the U.S. Army. We were in Philadelphia, and um, we did an activity where... I handed all the soldiers, they gra grabbed a sheet of paper, and they created a two, a, a uh, kind of like a, like a two by two uh, grid, a two by two grid. So on the bottom, I'll do your, on the bottom left, it was ignore, bottom right, it was one upper, top left, your left, was uh, joy thief, and then over here is joy multiplier. I said, okay, take members of your family, and put the percentage, your own percentage, of how often you do these things with your family member. And so I'm walking around the room, and there's a commanding officer sitting at a table just like this, just like this, in a room just like this. And he's sitting there, and he's crying. I'm like, this is really interesting. And he's just sitting there, and just openly, just kind of, you just see tears coming down his cheek, and... You see, like, the other officers, like, looking at him, and it was, it, but he was just, didn't care. He was just crying. So I walk up to him, and I just put my hand on his shoulder. I'm like, you, you all right? Are you okay? And he goes, I just realized why my son hates me. I said, whoa. I said, and this, this gentleman was, uh, yeah, so he's, and so I said, what, what do you mean? He goes, I, I literally just realized why my, why my son and I do not have a good relationship. It wasn't until this very moment I realized my son and I do not have a good relationship. I have three kids. This is him. He has three kids. Oldest son doesn't have a good relationship with, and he has a good relationship with everybody else, his wife and his two other kids. 
And I said, why do you say that? And he goes, look at my chart. His chart was interesting. His wife, about, about 50% of the time, he ignores her. And then 50% of the time, he joy multiplies her. He's like, I'm going to be honest. He's like, sometimes I'm not as present, and she always gets mad at me, but it's, it's right there. His other two kids are pretty similar as well. Uh, he's like 80% joy multiplier, and then like 20% ignore. And so he's doing that with his kids. His son was way different. It was 90% joy thief, and it was 90% joy thief and 10% ignore. And he goes, as a dad who didn't have a father growing up, I wanted to push my son to be the best version that he possibly could be. And so when he came home with an A minus, I was like, no, that's not good enough. You need an A plus. When he said he made the, the JV team, that's not good enough. You need to be on the varsity team. When he said he made the varsity team, that's not good enough. You need to be starting on the varsity team. And he's sitting there telling me, he's like, I thought I was literally helping my son. And little did I realize I am joy thiefing every single good thing that he came to me or I was ignoring it. And he's just bawling. And he goes, I have, I have to call him. I have to call him. And so I'm like, what are you going to say? He goes, I just, I just, he goes, he's 27. Him and his wife have my, my only grandchild. And he goes, and I don't get to see my grandchild very much because my son and I don't have a very strong relationship. And he goes, I, I, I'm messing this up. And so he goes, I'm going to call him tonight. So he goes and he calls him that night. He shows up the next morning at the beginning of the conference. And he goes, I have to talk to you. I, I said, what is going on? He goes, listen to this. I call my son that night, and we get on the phone, and I haven't talked to him in a little while, and things are just weird. I said, hey, son, how you doing? He goes, oh, I'm good. I'm here at, a, I'm here at our, our son's uh, t-ball game. He goes, really? It's awesome. How's he doing? How's he playing? What does he love about baseball? What else does he love? Oh, he loves this. Oh, really? How about you? How are you doing? And he starts ACRing his son, and his son literally stops the conversation. He goes, dad? Is this you? And, he's, and he says, this is me now. And he goes, I'm sorry. Um, he goes, for what? He goes, I, I am sorry for trying to push you to the next level when I was really pushing you away. And they just ended up having a really good conversation. And again, that is just a little example of what Building a relationship so strong can bear the weight of truth looks like. So simple little strategy. I'm not saying this is the tool to save all relationships. It's a simple little strategy to help you build those relationships of trust. We're just getting started. That's number one. Okay, number two, number two. Okay, number two is really interesting. So what we are going to do, it's not the ABC game, but we're going to do something uh, a little similar. You're not going to be competing against everybody. What I want to show you, I want to give you an example to show you that, and I was just talking to somebody, I can't remember who it was. One thing that is really interesting thing about the brain is that you can have a certain pattern. You have a certain system, there's certain things that you, you do it. But if you add a, a little element to the system, it can throw you off. It can make it more difficult. Then add another little wrinkle to the system, it can make it more difficult. Tiny little things that should not be hard, but it does. And the harder it becomes for someone, the less motivated they are. So I want to give you an example of what it looks like. I want to show you something that is unbelievably easy to do. Unbelievably easy. Like, fifth, like kindergartners can do it. Your three-year-olds could do this. But I'm going to give you two. I'm going to, I'm going to make it a little bit harder, and you are about to see that it is going to throw you for a loop or someone else, your partner for a loop. So this is how you do it. You need a partner, okay? You're, you need a partner. So you and one other person, I'm going to show you cognitive science in the making right here. You're going to see something so easy turn into something so difficult, and you're going to be like, I do not know why that was so hard, okay? Okay, so you have a, gra grab your partner. High five your partner so I can see that everyone has a partner. And if you have a group of three, if you have a group of three, that's okay. This is what we're going to do. Yes, you're going to want to participate just to see what this is like. Because if 
you're not participating, you're going to watch this, you're going to be like, that is so easy. How is it? How are you making this look so hard? Then you try it, you're like, oh, that is very difficult. Okay, so if you are in a group of three, this is what I'd like you to do. You're going to have three rounds, three rounds. Round one, just you and your partner go. Round two, you and a different partner. Round three, you and a different partner. And so just you can't have three people doing it at the same time. Okay, here we go. Very simple. Round one, so simple. All you're going to do is count to three. That's it. You're just going to count to three. If I'm with me and my invisible partner, I'm going to say one. My partner's going to say two. And I'm going to say three. My partner is going to say one. I'm going to say two, three. Then I'm going to say one, two, three. It's not a race. It's not a race. But let's see if you, you might start out slow. Some of you are going to make it a race. Uh, you, you're going to start off slow. But then let's see you get a little faster, a little faster, a little faster. See, simple. Okay. Some of you are already nervous. I can see it in your face. Um, just, get, just have compassion with your partner. Work through it. This is the easy round, too. Okay, ready, set, go. Couple of seconds. Okay, so you got a little rhythm. You got a little rhythm. Some of you struggled a little bit more than I thought you would. That's okay. That's okay. Okay, you're about to see. Now it's going to get real. All you're going to do, all you're going to do, you can still count to three. Still count to three. All you're going to do, instead of saying the number two, you're going to clap. Don't say two. So my partner's going to say one. I'm going to, and they're going to say three. I'm going to say one. My partner's going to clap. Don't say two. I'm going to say three. So instead of saying two, you just clap. Simple wrinkle. Have fun. Go. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Here we go. Here we go. Last one. Last round. Last round. Last round. It's so interesting. Hey, yo, exactly. You're like, wait, why, why am I clapping? Why am I saying a letter? Okay. Here's the last one, last one. Simple, simple little wrinkle, simple wrinkle. One stays the same, so we're good there. You're still clapping. Two is still a clap. Instead of saying three, you're just going to stomp. Instead of saying three, you're just going to stomp. So the only number we should be hearing is the number one. Okay, about 15 seconds. Ready, set, go. Okay, okay, very good. Very, very good. Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, the reason, yeah, you can high five your partner. You can high five your partner. Good job. Okay, okay. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. The reason we do this, act, this silly, silly, almost dumb activity is to show that you, every layer of, of complication you add, even a thin layer, it could make, it slows down the processing system. It, you just have to think a little bit more. And the more you have to think, the more errors you make, the more errors you make, all of a sudden, performance starts to drop. And when performance starts to drop, motivation can start to go down. And then all of a sudden, the leader says, what do I do to motivate my people? How do I motivate them? What we've ended up noticing, instead of asking that question, we ask a different question that produces better results. Principle number two. So we asked number one. Here's number two. Create an environment where my people motivate themselves. Create an environment where they motivate themselves. Not you motivating them, but they motivate themselves. So the question becomes, how do we do that? What are the elements and the variables to a highly motivated person? Now, this comes from the research of up in Canada, uh, Ryan Desi and uh, Ryan and Desi is called self-determination theory. You don't have to focus on that word. It's basically the science of motivation. And what the science of motivation states is that if people have three things, motivation goes up. Three things. 
Three things need to be present. The acronym is CAR. CAR, like driving a car. The C stands for competence. If we feel like we are good at our jobs, slash progressing, getting better, motivation goes up. If you can literally see you're putting points on the board, motivation goes up. Number two, A, autonomy, freedom, autonomy, feeling a sense of being in control. When you feel like you are in control of your life, you're in control of your domain, you're in control of your situation, motivation goes up. If you want to stifle someone's motivation, take away their perceived sense of control. Throw, make them feel like a pawn. Make them feel like they cannot control anything. And all of a sudden, you're going to see motivation drop. Number three, we kind of just talked about it. R stands for relatedness or relationships. If you as a leader, as a parent, as a coach, whatever it may be, can build an environment, a system where they can build relationships with each other and strengthen their relationships, motivation goes up. And so here you have it, C-A-R. So if you want to build an environment where people motivate themselves, you want to ask yourself the question, how do I create an environment, a system, to where my people are progressing? where they feel like they're stacking small wins. They feel like they're stacking small wins. Number two, or even yourself. Like you can even look at it and just, maybe there's something you're trying to motivate yourself to do. Like you have a kind of a goal that you haven't told anybody about, but you want to get better at it. Create a mechanism to where you can see yourself stacking wins. Like small, tiny wins, gain that momentum. Number two question as a leader is, how do I create an environment where they feel like they're in control? This autonomy. How do I give them a sense of, Okay, they have control over their domain. Not everything. You're not going relinqu to relinquish complete control. We have a, a job to do. We have a business to run. Um, but to have them have a sense of control. And then number three, how do I help them strengthen their relationships with each other? So this is what I'd like you to do in your, with your partner. There's a lot of experience in this room. Tons. Tons. And what I have found in my experience doing this part is that some of the best stories and best mechanisms of enhancing all three of these things come from the audience themselves. You're already doing it. Some of you are literally already doing some of these things. You just didn't have a name to it. Like you never, you don't have a name to it, whether it be in work or even at home. Maybe you're doing some of these things at home that just work. Like you found it works for you at least. It works for you right now. What I would like you to share with somebody next to you, your partner or somebody else, pick one of those elements, competence, autonomy, or relatedness. Pick one of those, and I want you to share with somebody, what have you done, what have you done as a leader or as a parent or as a coach to increase that level in the pe people that you lead, in the people that you lead? What have you done already? Without even hearing this presentation, what have you done, seen is helpful for you, to increase one of those things with the people that you lead in any domain? Family, work, whatever. Time is yours.
about 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Okay, uh, thanks again for participating. Hopefully you were able to share, uh, we won't share as a group, we won't share as a group, but hopefully you're able to share some things that were insightful, or even just to get the, get the ball rolling thinking about these things. These are the type of conversations that we have every day with our leadership, with our, with our executives, with our coaches, because we are leading very high elite alpha males who don't like to be told what to, what to do, but they need direction. And so these thoroughbreds is like, you gotta be very deliberate and, and really leverage behavioral science to be able to leverage these guys. So let me give you an example. We, were, we, have, a, we have a guy and um, he, didn't, he just didn't want a condition. He didn't, he didn't want a condition. He's tired, we get it. You're tired, you have it, but he needed to get some conditioning in. But he didn't want to get conditioning in. And so we wanted to leverage autonomy. And so we said, okay, uh, not we, but our strength and conditioning coach learning how to, how to connect with these guys. He goes, okay, uh, we can do this. Okay, which, what are you going to do? You can do, we can do, uh, we can do the bike or you can do shuttle runs. Which, which one do you want to do? He goes, hmm. He goes, okay, I'll do shuttle runs. And so he came in not wanting to do any conditioning at all. But when he was given the option, okay, how about we do this? You get to choose. You're going to choose. You're going to do conditioning, but you can choose this one or this one. So he had a sense of control. He went, uh, I'm going to go this one. And wouldn't you know it, he went and had a great conditioning session when he did not want anything to do with conditioning. It's a simple little thing. And not, that's a simple little example. It's kind of like with children. It's, I don't want vegetables. Okay, do you want broccoli or do you want carrots? Hmm, carrots. Okay, go, go. Okay, you say you get carrots. And so you're eating your vegetables. What, which one? Provide, that's what autonomy looks like. Just providing some sense of direction and kind of like you get to choose. You're going to do it. How do you want to do it? We're going to do it this way or this way? Okay, great. We're going to do it this way. And so those are simple little things. Again, so creating this environment, which leads us to principle number three. In order to create a high-performance environment, you want to cultivate the growth mindset. We have spoken about this. We spoke about this this morning. One of my favorite things about the best in the world is how coachable they are. The best in the world have coaches. The best in the world are humble and they're willing to learn and they want feedback on how to get better. And that's what we're going to talk about today. How do you do that? How do you cultivate the growth mindset? What does it look like? Uh, before I get into it, in 2011, I'm sitting in my office at Fort Sam Houston, San Antonio, Texas, working with combat medics, military intelligence, and wounded warriors. I'm sitting in my office, my calendar is empty. I don't have something for like two hours, my next presentation in two hours. And I hear the front door open and someone goes to our, our, our resource manager or secretary in the front and, and he goes, does Justin work here? She goes, yes. And he goes, I need to see him now. She goes, do you have an appointment with him? And he goes, no, I just need to talk to him now. And I'm like, who is that? I look at, my, I look at my, uh, my screen, no appointments. She comes into my office. She goes, there is a soldier here who wants to talk to you, and he does not look happy. Do you want me to schedule an appointment? Do you just let him catch his breath? I was like, no, send him in. I have a weird, I'm weird. I really like conflict. 
weird. It's gotten me in a lot of trouble, but I had this weird desire. Like I, I lean into conflict, and I was like, good. I wasn't expecting this. This is good. This is going to be good for breakfast. And so uh, he walks in. He walks into my office and just sits in a chair, and he's just like looking around the walls. And around the wall, I have pictures of brains. I have my family. I have uh, just like just different decoration, whatever. And he's looking around. Never seen this guy in my life. He looks around and he goes, what's this crap you do? He didn't say crap. We're just keeping it clean. We're on camera. Um, and, so, and so he goes, what's this crap you do? I said, okay, uh, I'm sorry, what? He goes, what is this crap you do? I said, well, I'm a performance in our title. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a mental performance enhancement specialist. My job is to help people perform at the highest level and their high levels of stress and just stare at them. And he goes, that crap won't work with me. And he just, sitting, just sits there. And I was like, I don't even know who his name is. Don't even know who he is. He doesn't know who I am. I'm like, I was like, I was like you're right. It won't. And I turn around and I go back to, and I go back to, my, uh, back to my, uh, my computer, like cat pawing it. I don't know if you've seen that cat gif. Like, I'm not even typing anything. I'm just furious. I'm just like, what am I doing? And he's sitting behind me and he didn't, he didn't move. Guy didn't move. And he's sitting there. He's like, but do you think you can help me? And I just heard it in his voice. I turn around, I'm like, who are you? Like, wh wh what brings you to my office? He goes, okay, I got to tell you my, can I tell you my situation? I'm like, yeah, go ahead. He goes, okay. I'm about to get kicked out of the army. I said, okay. He goes, my wife is divorcing me. My kids can't stand me. I'm almost bankrupt. I've been told how bad of a leader I am and how bad of a soldier I am. And I'm sleeping on the living room floor of some guy I don't know because I got kicked out of my house. And he goes, I'm messed up. And somebody in our schoolhouse said, go talk, go talk to Justin, and he, he can go over some stuff with you just to see kind of like last-ditch effort, see stuff. And so I was like, okay. And so, so let me get this straight. Like, so let me get this straight. People, which you're not, oh, he talked about how much he complains about everything too. I complain about it. I said, okay, so your wife going through a divorce, financial stuff, struggling, Parenting struggling, work struggling, is like everything. Every single thing in my life is absolute, t absolutely terrible. I said, okay. So we go over something. We're about to talk about it right now. We go over these things that I'm about to share with you right now. When he hears it, he's like, I have never heard of this before. He goes, this is unbelievable. I said, really? He goes, yeah, this is, this is crazy because I am complete not that. I said, okay, we're going to come up with a plan. We came up with some strategies, and then he just had to check in once a week. So three months, uh, about two weeks, no, about, about six weeks pass. Door opens up out of nowhere. It's Justin here. I know that voice now. I'm like, uh, and he's not scheduled, and he comes in, and he sits down on my desk. He sits down on the desk, but sits down in the chair again, and he goes, everything you taught me is crap. I'm like, Okay. All right. And I said, I said, what? He goes, okay, let me just give you background. We finalized our divorce, still bankrupt. Kids still can't stand me. And I'm still sleeping on the living room floor of this guy. Only good part is I know him better now. So we're friends now. I'm like, okay. He goes, everything you taught me, absolute crap. I said, okay. I'm just like staring at him. I was like, you didn't come all this way to tell me this. He goes, yeah, I did. I said, no, I do not believe you. I said, your office is on the other side of base. You spent all that time to come here. I know where you should be right now, but you came into my office unexplained to tell me this. I do not believe, a, I don't believe you. What did you really want to tell me? And he smiled and he said, because I know why. He goes, the way I've been treating my wife, I would divorce me too. He goes, the, my kids have complete understand. I can totally see why they don't want anything to do with me, and I'm doing everything I can to, re to recoup it. I should get fired. I've been terrible. I've been horrible complaining. I've been a bad teammate. I've been a bad, uh, I've been bad for, I've just been bad in a lot of different things. And then he goes, my money, I'm just frivolous. I'm spending my money like crazy. 
And he goes, I now finally realize that, and now I'm ready to make these changes. It's going to be very difficult, but I'm ready to make these changes. I just want to come and tell you that I wasn't expecting change of results, but it's changing me. It's helping me. And so he ends up leaving. This is what we ended up talking about. The growth versus the fixed mindset. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to split this room in half. You guys are going to be my growth mindset group. Growth mindset. You all are going to be my fixed mindset group. Fixed mindset. So you, I imagine none of you have read any of the research articles. None of it. Of, of, of implicit theories. Probably none of them. But watch how intuitive it is. You all know exactly what, it, what the difference is. Growth mindset definition grows. Work in progress, uh, always under construction. Fixed mindset, stuck, stagnant, never moves. Will not change, will not move. Basically, that's it. This gro side, growth mindset, willing to change. This side, not willing to change. Stuck, stagnant. There are five characteristics that separate the two. Five of them. And I'm going to go through each five, and you're going to tell me how each one responds. So number one. They have a completely different view on failure. Failure. This group who has never read one article on growth mindset for Carol Dr. Carol Dweck at Stanford, in your opinion, if you had to guess, how does a growth mindset person view failure? How do you think they view it? How do they interpret failure if you have a growth mindset? Learning. That's exactly, you learn. You learn from failure. My fixed mindset crew, how do you view failure? End of the world. Absolutely devastating. Nothing I can, it's not an event. It defines who I am. Good. Number one, the failure. Number two, obstacles. Getting outside of your comfort zone. Growth mindset crew, how do you all view obstacles? If, if somebody asks you to do something hard, something difficult, how do you view it? A challenge, bring it on. But here's my, but what if you fail? Learn from it. I tried. I'm better as a result of it. They want the hard, bring it, bring the challenge. Okay, great. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to figure it out. I'm not afraid to look like a fool because who does know what they're doing? We're, we'll learn from it. You guys, fixed mindset. If somebody asks you to do a challenge or something hard, how do you view obstacles? Cannot do it. What did you say? Yeah, oh gosh, here we go again. Can't do it. You avoid obstacles like the plague. You do not want the hard thing because if you, the odds are likely you're going to fail and it's devastating to fail. So you want the easy road. You want it to be simple. You want homeostasis. You want comfort zone. Keep it simple. Number three, effort level. Giving your best effort. Growth mindset. Let's say you show up to work and you only feel about 70%. You only feel 70%. How do you view effort? Like, actually, let me change, let me change that. Let's say you're losing by a lot. Let's say you have a certain goal and there's no way you're going to reach it. Like, you're not going to reach it. Like, we just, just, it's, the math doesn't add up. What happens to your effort? Keep going. Okay, you know what? Let's get as close as we can. Keep the effort as the best we can. Now, how about this? Let's say you had a goal and you shattered your goal with tons of time left. What happens to your effort? Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Okay, let's, let's keep it up. Let's keep it up. I don't care what the results are. I'm going to give the best of what I have. You guys, my fixed, my fixed mindset group, if you see you're not going to hit a goal and you know it, everyone knows it, what's going to happen to your effort level? Done. What's the use? What is, I'm sorry, sandbag. I told you, I knew this wasn't going to be a good idea. Exactly. That's, that's what happens at the effort level. Their effort fluctuates and diminishes be, dis, depending on the results and how close they are to the target. A lot of times also, they'll hit their goal, and what happens to their effort a lot of time? Okay, I don't need to push it anymore. Status quo, hit it. Did what I needed to do. Fixed mindset. Number three. Or number four. Seek critical feedback. Growth Mindset Crew, what do you guys feel about critical feedback? Why do you want it? It makes you better. One thing that, we, that the research shows about elite performers 
they not only they don't only they not only accept critical feedback, they crave it. They seek it. Cleveland Browns, we had a receiver core. I uh, was with uh, Jarvis Landry. So Jarvis Landry, receiver, uh, this is back in his heyday. He was one of the receivers. They're running drills. So he's running his drills. He's doing his drills during practice. And the coach was like, good job. Good job. Good job to everybody. Good job. That babe. Hey, good hands. Great job. Jarvis, in the middle of the drill, takes off his helmet. He goes, are you going to make us better or what? The coach was like, what? He goes, are you going to make us better? He goes, anyone could come off the street and say, good job, good job, good job. You're an NFL coach. You have your eyes. You have better eyes than everybody else. Be hard on us. Give us hard, critical feedback. We're not doing a good job. We want to be elite. And so he puts his helmet on, and the coach is like, your hand was too low. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, I'll get it up next time. And so they see critical feedback. So my question is, when was the last time you went looking for critical feedback, elicited no, don't tell me I'm good. What do I need to get better at? Growth mindset. You guys, fixed mindset. How do they view, how does a fixed mindset person view critical feedback? What do you know? It's defensive. It's, you don't know me. It's, it's, it's defensive because they fundamentally don't believe they can change. You guys believe you can change. I can evolve. Okay, I can get better. It'll be hard. I'm going to have to get creative, but I can get better. You guys are like, okay, like, Okay, you're just highlighting something I literally cannot do anything about, but you can. And so that's it's a, it's a mindset shift. Last but not least, the success of others. If you have the growth mindset and someone else succeeds, not you, someone else succeeds, how do you view that? Okay, if it's a teammate, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah teammate, awesome, it might be great. What if a competitor succeeds? Say that, what are they doing? How are they getting better? What are they going, exactly. It's either you're excited for your teammate or if somebody succeeds, you're like, okay, what are they doing that I'm not doing? What are they leveraging? How are they operating? What, what can they do? How can we get better? They use it as a signal to say, okay, to learn. You guys, when someone else succeeds and you don't, well, how does that affect the fixed mindset person? Jealous threatened, envy. How dare they get that promotion? How, how dare they do? They, they don't even work that hard. They don't, they don't even work as hard as me. They haven't been, oh, they must know somebody. Oh, they got favor. The fixed mindset is all about jealousy and all about envy and just pulling somebody down as opposed to just pausing and asking, huh, wonder, I wonder what they're doing. We're human. We're never going to always be fixed and growth mindset. I get it. We are going to have fixed and growth mindset moments but if you look down at that, so this soldier who I was working with, all he did was learn that. That's all he had to learn, and he identified moments he was fixed and identified that moments he was growth. And so he, all he did was try to identify, okay, more of a growth mindset, more of a growth mindset. And so this is how we are going to finish. So there you have it. There you have the, the three things, whatever, two things. The two things, so we talked about building relationships so strong it could bear, bear the weight of truth. Maybe did three. Build a, a high-performance environment um, to help people motivate themselves. And number three, cultivate a growth mindset. This is how we are going to finish. With someone sitting next to you, last time for participation, I want you to share with them one thing, one takeaway that you're like, you know what? Of all the stuff that was shared, this is the one thing I want to apply and I want to remember. One thing. Time is yours. Share with your partner one thing that you want to apply and remember.
about 30 seconds. I'm sorry. That's how he, he ended up, and we ended up, uh, I think he got fired. Yeah, never came back. He sent me an email later on. That he, like years later, he's doing it much better. But he's like growth mindset. He's working on my growth mindset. Um, yeah, that ended up playing like long term. Uh, playing out. Yeah. Okay. Thanks again. Once again, thank you, thank you, thank you for participating. I want to close with one experience, a final experience that I had. We often bring in guest speakers. And these guest speakers have been amazing. They're, they're awesome. But I'll never forget one guest speaker in particular. When, he, when we heard his occupation, we were like, why is he here? Like, why, like no offense, like, but why, what does he possibly, what is he going to tell us? He's a dog expert. And we're like, why is a dog expert talking to us? And he shows a picture of a bulldog on the board, on the screen. And it was just a picture. And he's like, we all love, a team loves dogs. Tons of people have dogs. He goes, what animal, what dog is this? And they're like, and we all said, bulldog. He goes, yep. He goes, do you know the history of these dogs? No one knew. We're not experts. So he goes, back in the day, these animals were used to herd what? What did they help herd? And we all yelled, sheep. He's like, no, bulls, bulldog. And we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, so, uh, we were, and so, bull. So these dogs were used to herd bulls. And so he goes, back in the day, a bull herder had a very difficult job to move a herd of bulls from one place far away to another place. Occasionally, these bulls would get stubborn, fall to the ground, and they wouldn't move. The bull herder would come up, grab his stick, and start poking the bull. You better get up. Yeah, yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go. Sometimes the bull was just so stubborn it wouldn't move. That's when the bulldog would come into work. The bulldog would go get into the face of the bull much smaller, much weaker, Stare the bull in the face while it's laying on the ground and start barking at it, saying, you better get up. You better get up. But the bull doesn't speak bulldog, obviously. Doesn't move. Sees this little thing yapping at it. Doesn't move an inch. So then the bulldog does what it's trained to do. Jumps up and crushes the bull's face. The bull stands up and has a little bulldog dangling from his face now. In excruciating pain, trying to relieve itself, it starts slamming the bulldog on the ground against trees, against rocks, over and over again. The bulldog is taking an absolute beating, but is not letting go. Finally, the bull can't take the pain anymore. He falls to the ground. Bulldog lets go. After taking a beating, backs up and starts barking. You better get up or we're going to dance like that again. Now the bull speaks bulldog. <laughs> It'll stand up and follow that little bulldog wherever it goes. The reason I share this story is because in your pursuit of growth, in your pursuit of whatever goals that you have for your company, in pursuit of the best version of yourself, you are going to get beat up. You are going to get slammed. You're going to feel outmatched. You're going to get destroyed. But as long as you have the bulldog mentality, and cling on to your why, and cling on to your purpose, and cling on to why you do what you do in your targets, you'll be amazed on what you can do and how well you can do it. Thank you guys so much. All right, well, hopefully uh, Justin lived up to the billing I gave him this morning. I knew he's going to be a great way to close this thing out. So thank you, Justin. Really appreciate it. And we know why the Rays keep making the playoffs every year, right? Um, so I hope everybody had an enjoyable day. Uh, the sessions are complete. Um, the board, you guys have a quick meeting where we met yesterday uh, as soon as we get out of here. The rest of you we will see at 6.30 in the grand ballroom foyer. The grand ballroom is on the second level of the main building. So where we had lunch today, Fred's, there was a stairwell right there. If you go up that stairwell and down the hallway, you will get to the grand ballroom. You can't miss it because right now it's the only thing not under construction on that floor. Um, 
And you know what? We had some obstacles in planning this event. Uh, you know, the Justin uh, talked about our growth mindset was, hey, we're going we're gonna to jump over them. And we moved our sessions into here for the day instead of over there where they're having construction. So, hey, it worked out. Um, but we'll be there starting at 6.30 to 7.30. Dinner starts at 7.30. We will have the um, table lists there at the foyer so you can see it. It's probably still out there right now if you want to take a quick glance at to what table you're at. But we'll have that available when you get there at 6.30. And we will see everyone tonight. Thank you very much.